In the previous sessions, we discussed the thoracic cage, which offers protective benefits to the underlying organs. Not surprisingly, some of our most vital organs, the heart and lungs, receive protections from this structure. But what about the abdomen? While some of the superior lying organs also receive some form of protection, there's a large portion of the abdomen that completely lacks bony protection. Despite this, isometric contraction of the abdominal musculature can afford people some form of protection from mechanical trauma. We'll be discussing these muscle layers in this present session on the anterolateral abdominal wall. Welcome back to this session on the anterolateral abdominal wall. The abdominal cavity refers to the region inferior to the diaphragm and superior to the pelvic inlet. It is composed of a series of fascial and myotendinous soft tissue layers. Now, this design allows greater amounts of movement in the abdominal region when compared to the thoracic region, but at the cost of decreased protection. Now, as we'll see, it is possible to increase protection and stabilize the abdominal region of the segment by actively contracting these muscles. This is also the reasoning behind core exercises. Now, for this session, we'll start by looking at the borders defining the abdominal quadrants and identify the viscera found within each. We'll then peel back the layers of the abdominal wall and analyze its structure. We'll then finish with a brief look at the blood supply and lymphatics of the anterolateral abdominal wall and discuss their significance in clinical medicine. Before we get into the specific layers of the anterolateral abdominal wall, it's a good opportunity to introduce the concept of the abdominal quadrants. This concept is used in clinical practice to localize such things as pain and injury. Two reference lines divide the abdomen into four separate quadrants. The median plane, a mid-sagittal vertical line extending from the tip of the xiphoid process through the umbilicus and down to the superior tip of the symphysis pubis, divides the abdomen into right and left sides. The umbilical plane, a horizontal line passing through the umbilicus, divides the abdomen into upper and lower sections. The upper right quadrant contains, among other things, the liver, gallbladder, head of the pancreas, and right kidney. The upper left quadrant hosts the majority of the stomach, the whole of the spleen, body of the pancreas, and left kidney. The right lower quadrant is most noted for the vermiform appendix, but also contains the right ureter, and in females, the right ovary and fallopian tube, while the left ureter, ovary, and fallopian tube are all found in the left lower quadrant. One final note here, there is another classification system used by traditional anatomists. Two vertical and three horizontal lines divide the abdomen into nine separate regions. Being familiar with the terminology here will help you in identifying the location of certain structures we'll be discussing. But from a practical perspective, clinicians rarely refer to this system, so it'll not be emphasized in the present video. As mentioned at the start of the video, the anterolateral abdominal wall is primarily composed of muscle, tendon, and fascia. There's a superficial fascial component composed of a loose and dense fascial layer. There are also three separate broad, flat muscles that wrap around the lateral aspect of the wall. A pair of longitudinal muscles are found more anteriorly. And finally, we'll give special attention to the inferior portion of the wall that forms the inguinal canal. In the anatomy lab, it's necessary to move through each layer of the anterolateral abdominal wall from superficial to deep and so it also makes sense to do the same in the class discussion. Just beneath the skin is Camper's fascia, composed of adipose connective tissue. As you would expect, this tissue tends to be yellow in appearance and is highly variable in thickness. In frail elderly individuals, it is next to non-existent, but can also be remarkably thick in obese individuals. This contributes to android obesity, or what is colloquially referred to as a beer belly. In my home country of Canada, we'll often refer to this as Molson muscle. It does serve an important function, however. It provides insulation against the loss of body heat and cushioning to protect internal organs from mechanical trauma. A little trick for remembering the name. If you go camping in the winter, you'd like to have a nice thick sleeping bag to protect you from the cold. That's what camper's fascia does. Just deep to the camper's fascia is scarpa's fascia. Sorry, no nifty tricks for remembering this one. 
Unlike campers fascia, scarpus fascia is composed of dense irregular connective tissue and is therefore more consistent in its thickness. It serves as an anchor between campers fascia and the underlying musculature, acting somewhat like elastic wallpaper paste. Deep to scarpus fascia are the myotendinous layers. If you've already watched the session on intercostal muscles and their fiber orientation, it'll make this concept much easier to understand. The oblique muscles originate posteriorly off the ribs and thoracolumbar fascia surrounding the erector spinae muscles and wrap anterolaterally to fuse with the contralateral side at the midline. Similar to the intercostals, the outermost layer is referred to as the external oblique muscles. They originate off of ribs 5 through 12. Along the back, the posterior most fibers run more or less vertically to insert upon the iliac crest. As we move more anterior, the fibers run in a more oblique fashion, in the same hand and pocket orientation that we see for the external intercostal muscles. As the external oblique reaches the middle axillary line, the muscle fibers transition into a broad, flat, aponeurotic tendon that fuses with the contralateral side along the midline. Contraction of the external oblique will draw the ribs inferior and closer to the midline, resulting in flexion in contralateral rotation of the trunk. Deep to the external obliques, we see the internal obliques. Posteriorly, the fibers are continuous with the thoracolumbar fascia that invests the erector spinae muscle group. The fibers project anterolaterally in a radiating pattern. The superior fibers are directed superiorly to attach to the lower ribs. The intermediate fibers run more or less transversely, transition into an aponeurosis, and fuse with the contralateral tendon along the midline and the inferior fibers are directed inferiorly to insert along the pubic crest and contribute to the inguinal canal. The internal obliques contribute to trunk flexion and unilateral contraction will produce ipsilateral rotation of the trunk. The transversus abdominis also originates off the thoracolumbar fascia, but in this case the fibers all run in a transverse direction and fuse along the midline, again as a ponderosis. The internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles work together to compress the abdominal contents and provide active tension and rigidity to the abdominal wall. This helps to brace the abdomen against mechanical trauma or aid in increasing intra-abdominal pressure, such as seen during defecation. Beneath the transversus abdominis is one final fascial layer, the transversalis fascia, which is the deepest part of the anterolateral abdominal wall. Superiorly, the transversalis fascia blends with the fascia covering the undersurface of the diaphragm, so it doesn't continue into the thorax. Engagement of the internal obliques and transversus abdominis is at the heart of core exercises. Remember, we said that these muscles fuse with the thoracolumbar fascia surrounding the erector spinae muscle. The theory behind core exercises is that by properly engaging these abdominal muscles, tension is generated in the thoracolumbar fascia to tighten around and provide support to the erector spinae musculature to avoid back strains during heavy lifting or other such activities. And there does seem to be evidence to suggest that core training is associated with lower risks of back injury. In addition to the broad lateral muscle group, the longitudinally running rectus abdominis muscles extend inferiorly from the costal margin and xiphoid process to insert on the pubic crest and symphysis pubis. Rectus abdominis serves as the principal flexor of the trunk. One final muscle to mention in this region is the pyramidalis, a vestigial triangular shaped muscle that projects from the pubic crest to fuse bilaterally along the midline. Technically, this muscle would also serve as a trunk flexor, but its contribution would be very minimal. So, as previously mentioned, we have these three broad tendinous aponeurosis from the lateral muscle group that fuse bilaterally at the midline, but we also have this vertically running rectus muscle just off the midline. So, how does that work exactly? We'll start with the internal oblique aponeurosis, actually. As this tendon approaches the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, the tendon bifurcates, with half of the tendon passing anterior to the rectus abdominis and the other half passing posterior. After passing across the muscle belly, the tendon once again fuses just past the medial border of the rectus abdominis and ultimately fuses along the midline with the internal oblique aponeurosis from the contralateral side along the midline. Okay, so that's the internal oblique. Now, what about the others? 
the external oblique passes entirely anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. But as it does, it interdigitates with the anterior running fibers of the internal oblique to form a single fused tendon called the anterior rectus sheath. The aponeurosis from the transversus abdominis, on the other hand, runs posterior to the rectus abdominis, fusing with the posterior division of the internal oblique to form the posterior rectus sheath. So on the medial border of the rectus abdominis muscle, it's really the anterior and posterior rectus sheaths fusing with one another, and ultimately with the fused rectus sheaths from the contralateral side. This midline fusion is so thick that it has a distinct white appearance from the external surface. As a result, anatomists refer to it as the linea alba, or white line. Okay, so that's the situation in the superior part of the abdomen. But once we get about an inch below the umbilicus, things change around a little bit. We see a transition in which all three aponeuroses now run anterior to the rectus abdominis. At this stage, we see the translucent transversalis fascia lying immediately posterior to the rectus abdominis. This transition is typically so dramatic that an arch is usually seen between the opaque superior and translucent inferior regions known as the arcuate line. Before we move on, one final note about rectus abdominis. It's not one long continuous muscle with fibers extending from the costal margin to the pubic crest, like we see with most muscles. There are three to four places along the length of the muscle where the fibers taper, allowing fusion of the anterior and posterior rectus sheaths. These tendinous interscriptions, as they are sometimes called, are more recessed than the muscle fibers. This accounts for the six-pack or washboard abs appearance that is attributed to muscular individuals. When we look at the inner surface of the anterolateral abdominal wall, you notice that it's not perfectly smooth and even. One midline structure and two pairs of structures on either side of the midline create five protrusions that are visible through the fascial covering, similar to the mound you would make under your sheets while lying in bed. The unpaired median umbilical fold lies along the midline of the anterolateral abdominal wall, extending from the apex of the bladder up to the umbilicus. This fold is created by the uracus, which is the remnant of the allantoi, an embryological structure that assists with the management of liquid waste in the embryo. Just lateral to the structure are the bilateral medial umbilical folds. Notice the difference in the names here. Median is the midline and medial to either side. The medial umbilical folds mark the location of the umbilical ligaments. Once again, these are embryological remnants of the umbilical arteries that deliver blood from the fetus to the placenta. Moving further laterally, we find the lateral umbilical folds. No embryological remnant here. The folds are generated by the inferior epigastric vessels that stem off the external iliac artery and run superiorly, posterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. The lateral umbilical folds are actually an important clinical landmark. Just lateral to these folds is the deep inguinal ring, which is the location where an indirect inguinal hernia initially begins. On the other hand, the region just medial to the lateral umbilical folds represents a thin region of the abdominal wall and is another common site of abdominal protrusions known as direct inguinal hernias. Because of its clinical implications, clinicians refer to the inguinal triangle, or more commonly referred to as Hesselbeck's triangle, defined by the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle medially, the inguinal canal inferiorly, and the lateral umbilical fold laterally. Again, this is the location of direct inguinal hernias, while indirect inguinal hernias take place just outside this region, just lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels, making up the lateral umbilical folds. We're going to take a moment to look at the blood supply for the anterolateral abdominal wall. Superficially, the inferior portion of the wall is supplied by the superficial epigastric arteries medially and superficial circumflex iliac arteries laterally, both of which branch off the femoral artery just past the inguinal canal. Branching from further up off the external iliac artery is the deep circumflex iliac arteries, which supply blood to the supralateral aspects of the wall anastomosing with descending branches off the intercostal arteries. 
As already explained, the inferior epigastric arteries allow branches from the external iliacs, supplying the superomedial aspects of the anterolateral abdominal wall. They anastomose with the superior epigastric vessels, which represent one of the terminal branches off the internal thoracic artery. The other terminal branch is the musculophrenic artery, which runs infralaterally behind the costal cartilages connected to the false ribs. As the name implies, it supplies blood to both the anterolateral thoracoabdominal wall as well as the anterior portion of the diaphragm. We'll finish the segment with a bit of surface anatomy. This will be highly variable based on the size of the individual, as many of these features will not be visible in endomorphic or heavier set individuals. As previously mentioned, the sternal notch and sternal angle are of importance for understanding the location of the great vessels and for identifying the insertion of the second rib. In ectomorphic or splendor individuals, the ribs and intercostal segments are more easily palpated. This is of importance for the correct placement of chest tubes, as we'll see in a later session. In well-toned individuals, the rectus abdominis muscles bellies are prominent, separated by the tendinous intersections. Lateral to the rectus abdominis, the crescent-shaped linea semilunaris mark the myotendinous junction between the oblique musculature and the rectus sheaths. On the right side, it also helps in the identification of McBurney's point, which lies two-thirds of the distance along an imaginary line running from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. It approximates the most common location of the vermiform appendix within the abdomen. Tenderness and rebound pain in and around this area is a strong indicator of appendicitis. That will do it for this session on the anterolateral abdominal wall. In the next segment, we'll return to these layers and discuss how each contributes to the inguinal canal, and at least in the male, the scrotum and the spermatic cord. I'll see you then.